Hello everyone and welcome uh, to the Search Podcast. My name is Saad El Zaid and I'd like to thank all my listeners. Uh, hopefully I'll start to hear more and more feedback from you. I'm sure that there's lots of room for improvement. Um, today I figured we'd talk about intubation and setting yourself up to win or how to make fresh pasta. And I'll get into why that's a fairly good analogy a little bit later. But from the start, I think that it's important to understand that I'm not against any anesthetists, I'm not against any emergentologists, I'm not against any surgeons. I learned everything that I know today, and the reason why I have the confidence to have this podcast on is because I've learned everything that I know today from getting into trouble and having one of the three above help me out. My concern is that not all anesthetists are equal, not all surgeons are equal, not all critical care physicians are equal, and not all emergentologists are equal. Your background doesn't make a difference, but a subtle understanding of the game that you're playing does. And the issue that I have is that with most talks, they start off by talking about how much of airway experts they are. Then they talk about how they can recognize an emergent airway right off the bat. Then they talk about how they dealt with airway emergencies so elegantly and eloquently. And subsequently, they tell you how to avoid never events or what they call never events. And I have an issue with that structure. And my main concern is that if you were to look at the airway experts in the hospital, most of the time, the people you call will be anesthetists. Anesthetists are very good at dealing with the operating room airway. The operating room airway has a preset number of rules. And it's a one-on-one tournament. The recess room airway is a completely different beast. The recess room airway is Neo from the Matrix. It knows all the tricks. It's already tricked you enough times. And you and your team collectively are Mr. Smith. When shit hits the fan, excuse my French, and things don't go well, you keep trying to do the same thing over and over again. And the number increases over and over again. And we end up going into this endless cycle where people are screaming at each other. And time and time again, I've been called at 2 a.m. for something that looks like that. And I try and diffuse the situation. And that's a topic for a separate talk entirely. Um, A good place to start if you want to develop that hands-on expertise, which is not the topic that we'll be talking about today, is a series of lectures from SMAC 2013 that are available on their YouTube, uh, Vimeo, and um, website as well. And they reinforce the point that I'll touch on today, which is not knowing what you're doing, not recognizing that you're going up against NEO, not recognizing that difficult airways will happen, and that you can't kill a patient with a laryngoscope if you don't know and recognize that early, it's a huge deal. And and I, I really do think that at earlier stages during my training, having those videos available to me helped me out a lot uh, in developing the confidence, the expertise, and that mental thought process that you need. So to begin with, let's try and define what an airway expert is. Is it somebody who's done it 300 billion trillion times? Is it somebody who's done it the most times? Is it somebody who has access to the most courses or taught in the most courses? Is it somebody who's published on it more than 150 times? Or is it somebody who wrote the consensus guideline on it? Or is it somebody who can actually predict failure using specific scoring systems? And my issue with all the above is that, and with the idea that anesthetists are airway experts and the exclusive airway experts is the fact that They're trained to look at very specific things. And despite looking for these specific things, they tend to do it a little bit badly. And the quickest example that I can find is um, the uh, example from the Danish anesthesia database, which I'll be providing a link on. And it's not to rag on anesthetists or to say that they're bad people or to say that they're not good at what they're doing. It's to say that despite best efforts made, Even champion anesthetists who deal with the airway on a daily basis as an elective procedure for the most part, the predictability of a difficult airway is not there. We don't know how to predict them. And when you look at the randomized data from the same Danish anesthesia database, they tend to advocate for a predictive model that involves the SARI score, which uh, I've taken a picture of here and is available on Wikipedia and also I'll include the link for. Take a look at that score. It involves seven different factors, each of which has a sub-factor in it, each of it has a sub-scoring system in it, 
It'll take you at least half an hour to figure out. So good luck doing that in the middle of the emergency room. And good luck doing that on a crashing patient with hemorrhagic shock. You're just not going to be able to do it. Even the best predictive tool that they have won't tell you what to do. And in fact, the only type of expertise, if you look through the literature, that has been shown time and time again to prove that you're an expert is if you're a person who knows what your first option is, who's planned ahead, if you're a person who recognizes failure of intubation early and recognizes adjuncts, and if you're the person who has an ultimate bailout plan for your outcome. And uh, I'll gladly give a whole 45-minute talk on why the literature support supports all three. It doesn't say it out loud, but it supports all three, if you interpret the literature correctly. So let's start with first. Knows what the first option should be. For us in the emergency room, for people who are champion res resuscitationists, RSI will almost always be your first option, at least early on in your career. You won't be very comfortable with things like awake intubations. You won't be comfortable with things like delayed sequence intubations. And if you are that early in your career, then my friend, you're a lot smarter than I am, and maybe you should be giving this podcast instead. Even if you are comfortable with those things, your team may not be. And I can't emphasize this enough. Intubation requires somebody to put in the line, somebody to give the drugs, somebody to do the actual intubation, and somebody to be your backup, and then somebody to work on the ventilator. You need at least four to five people around you. That's called a team. Unless all of you are good at delayed sequence intubation, unless all of you are good at pre-oxygenating with BiPAP, you're not going to get it done slickly, and your patients will suffer for it. Now, when you look at RSA, RSI, in my mind, the key point of RSI is to acknowledge a number of things. The first is preparation, preparation, preparation forms the bulk of what you're going to do. And in my mind, it, it doesn't just start 10 minutes before you intubate the patient. It starts the first day you're at a new place. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Next is pre-oxygenation, pre-treatment, paralysis, induction, positioning right and then placement with proof the reason why i think of this as making pasta is because if you look if you talk to a chef or even if you look at the evidence quote unquote for making pasta and this is just one random article i picked out because it's fun to read and i'll provide a link for it if anybody's bored enough to read it making pasta involves multiple factors and the best people to make pasta are the people who know what factors or what, what ingredients they have, what the humidity around them is, how much water content is in the air around them, how long to wait for the pasta to leave in and, and, and to, to, to harden a little bit, and then how to boil it, and then how to season it. And, and when you put together all of those things, that knowledge of the surroundings, that knowledge of what you're going to cook it for, what you're going to cook it with, and what might make it even better, that's when you have somebody who knows how to make pasta, my friend. And, and for me, an intubation, it's just as satisfying as making good pasta. And when you actually get it done and you do it slickly and you do it slickly over and over and over again, it gives me an enormous sense of satisfaction. Because ultimately, it, it is about the patient that's in front of you at 2 a.m., but it's also about the system as well and how well the whole system works, right? So to start with, knowing what the first option should be does not start with knowing how to use a laryngoscope or using a laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope preferentially. It starts off with surveying your local ED and your resuscitation room, finding out what equipment is available, what drugs are available, who's going to help you out with the intubation, introducing yourself to them, getting to know what they like to have done, what their pet peeves are, what they, li what they don't like to have done, and what things you're not allowed to do in that institution and then having a discussion about what you like to do and sort of identifying any conflicts that may occur at time zero when you're trying to intubate somebody the ideal time to do all of this is at 6 a.m for me because i'm a surgeon and i wake up at five and have no life but for most people it'll probably be the start of the shift or right after rounds try and involve as much of the team that's going to be intubating with you as you can and remember, identify people within the team. One of the worst and most dangerous things that you can do is show up at a place, start your day, 
you're on day one and you assume that you have a, a respiratory technician with you at 2 a.m. And in ivory tower institutions, centers of excellence, yes, you will have that available to you. But in smaller institutions, institutions that may have more sporadic coverage for multiple reasons, your RT might not be available unless it's the morning. Find out who else is there for you in terms of backup. Are there anesthetists around? How experienced are the anesthetists? How comfortable are they intubating with you? How comfortable are they supervising you in a difficult intubation? Would they rather take over themselves? Find out what they view as the recipe for their pasta, the recipe for their difficult intubation. And then find out what your backup devices are. Not every place has a video laryngoscope. Not every video laryngoscope works in the exact same way. Not every video laryngoscope is quote-unquote good, i.e. you're not used to using every single video laryngoscope. And the institution may not be comfortable with using video laryngoscopes regularly. Develop a comfort, a comfort with the plan that you're going to be instigating at 2 a.m. Develop that, that, that ability to rehearse it. And, and go through multiple dry runs. And I love doing dry runs for everything, from surgical procedures like appendectomies or, or laparoscopic procedures such as laparoscopic cholecystectomies, all the way down to central line insertion. I really like doing that with teams and with students, with residents, because it, it, it gives you a gauge of people's level of expertise, how comfortable they are with you and how you fit in with the team. It also helps them develop a comfort with you and, and voices your concerns and theirs. It helps you decide who will run it and, and tells you who the confident person you want trying for the first time should be. And um, it helps you make sure that everybody's on the same page. And for people who don't intubate that often but are involved in critical care, for example, myself uh, these days, um, most of the patients come to me pre-intubated, quote-unquote. It's a good refresher from time to time to have somebody else's opinion in the room and to make you open that book or to make you go to that course. And I, I think that there's a lot of benefit to be had from, from going through multiple dry runs, particularly dry runs of resuscitations. And I'm not talking just about a debrief, quote-unquote. I'm, I'm talking about genuinely coming up with scenarios and going through them. Uh, during shifts. It keeps people on their toes and it makes people develop more of a comfort in discussing, discussing things and, and sort of gets all the conflicts out of the way. And you can have that discussion then instead of having it when you're, while you're trying to intubate. Um, also, uh, another piece of advice that I'd give, having worked in more than one place and sort of having been the new guy in the ED, and um, being identified as, as um, a resus wanker, as Scott Weingard would put it, um, go with what your team's comfortable with, not necessarily what you're comfortable with. You as an expert in resuscitation should have a wide gamut and should have a tolerance for multiple different things, a tolerance for multiple different options. Know what your cutoffs are for what medications you feel are quote-unquote wrong to use and what medications you feel are quote-unquote right to use. Know what neuromuscular blockade is available to you at that institution from your pharmacists. Know what opioids and analgesics are available to you and know what your awake intubation protocol should and would be. Um, in my mind, intubation is sort of also a... a, a um, a procedure, and, and all procedures to surgeons are the same. Um, all surgeons think in the following. We use devices to see things, so retractors, laryngoscopes, video laryngoscopes, laparoscopes, endoscopes, and we use instruments, snares, hooks, needle holders, ligatures, and in this case, tubes, uh, bougies, stilettes, and LMAs. Know what's available to you in your institution, be comfortable with it, especially if you're the new guy there, and then practice on it. It's okay to open up an expired piece of equipment. It's not so much okay to open up a not expired piece of equipment, but uh, ask permission and do it. Do not think of a surgical airway as your first line. For the love of God, it's one of the worst, most morbid things that you can do to a patient, and it's, it's traumatizing for the team as well, especially if you're the new guy. And... I thank God every day that I don't have to be the new guy who ends up doing a surgical airway, but uh, 
the days when or the day when that happens and I'm sure that there will be a day uh, in my infinitely short surgical career um, I'm pretty sure I'll, it'll be a long debrief and then try and find something that's evidence-based that you can put up um, my favorite is um, the uh, difficult airway society the UK's uh, difficult intubation guidelines I don't agree with everything on them but they cover more than one base, and this is just an example for your generic intubation where they they clearly outline that if you can't intubate on the first time, then put in an LMA or prepare to put in an LMA. And if you can't get that in, then try a third time, and if you can't, then go for your surgical airway. And, and I believe that this one is the um, slide where the anatomy is defined. They also have a slide for when the anatomy is defined, a slide for your obstetric patient, etc., etc., Get to read them, get to know them, and use them. You can modify them, but I wouldn't make my own one up. And the reason why I wouldn't make my own one up is because the more evidence-based you are within a set institution, the more you're likely you are to get buy-in from all the stakeholders within that department. Um, as a surgeon in the ED and in the resuscitation room, um, I'm often thought of as, as somebody barks orders and walks away. And let's face it, it, it isn't my home ground. And I realize that. I realize that I'm sort of a guest star for the most part. But A, I like being there. B, I like intubating. And so C, I have to get buy-in from, from the local stakeholders who, who own the place and have to clean up after me for the most part, right? So that's why I tend to go for evidence-based guidelines for the most part. And I'm saying the most part way too much. I agree with you. Last time, I promise. But uh, I find that there's some, some merit in that. And whether you take my two cents on that or not, your prerogative. Like I said, so just to recap, 6 a.m. discussion or whenever the team is there, identify the team, identify yourself to them, identify a first try person, identify your backup devices, and identify your backup person. That may be you, that may be somebody else, that may be your anesthetist, but identify somebody who's going to be your backup and let them know that you may call them, especially if you're the new guy in town. Develop a comfort with the plan and make sure that it's a plan that everybody agrees upon, not just your plan in your head. Verbalize it and do this early. Do this before you have to intubate for the first time. And I'm pretty sure that that, that sort of goes with your sort of introduction to, to your setting. Step two in my mind is recognizing failure. And by recognizing failure, what I really mean is recognizing a difficult airway early. Uh, as mentioned prior, the Danish anesthesia database shows us that no matter how many intubations that you've done, in 33,000 difficult airways, you're not going to predict more than 20 to 30 percent of them. This rings true now as well, but there are certain things that you can do to avoid that. And one of the first things that you can do is check the bleeping chart. Identify patients who desaturate quickly. The shorter time you have to do a surgical procedure, the, short, the harder it is going to be. That's true whether it's a ruptured AAA, an ED thoracotomy, or an intubation. Every procedure that you do in life, in my mind, and all procedures are procedures, they're the same, whether you're opening a chest, opening an abdomen, doing a craniectomy, or doing an intubation, they all have the same common denominator. If it becomes time sensitive, it's exponentially harder to do. And your skill set has to be exponentially better. Your level of experience on what to do, what not to do, and how to deal with the complications becomes higher. This is true for intubation as well. And be cognizant that when you can't bag a person, it's not a person that you should be intubating without a crack set next to you. If you can't bag them, there's already by default and de facto a problem with their anatomy. Lastly, be very wary if somebody who is just as good as you are, maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse, but more or less within your range, can't intubate on the first time and calls you for help. The reason why I say that is because time and time again, you get reports in the literature of X number of patients showing that your first chance is your best chance and the best person to intubate should intubate. That's one interpretation of these two papers. The other interpretation of these two papers and many others is if somebody who's actually good at routine intubations has difficulty on the first try, the second and third try won't go as well. So be cognizant of that. And that should be your trigger to set up your surgical airway and to set up your adjuncts, including an LMA. By the way, whenever I intubate, I have an LMA on the table regardless. 
It's usually the biggest LMA that I can find so that I can fit a bronchoscope through it. We'll talk about that later. But in my mind, my typical intubation kit includes an LMA by default and de facto because as mentioned prior, every single intubation that you do in the resuscitation room is going to be a kind of difficult intubation. It's going to be somebody who needs it as opposed to an elective intubation. Okay? Lastly, the bailout plan. So plan for the bailout plan just as you would plan for your intubation. Decide on what your aim is. In my mind, the aim of a bailout plan is to ventilate, it's to oxygenate, and it's to take the patient to a safe place. If an LMA does that for you, use the LMA. Don't do anything else. If bag mask does that for you, use a bag mask until your patient wakes up. And if a cryo does that for you, remember, surgical airway is not a one-person procedure. No procedure is a one-person procedure. Every single surgery that you do in life and every single procedure that you do in life will involve two to three people. A circulating nurse, a scrub nurse, a surgeon or an operator, assistant, OR tech or resident, an anesthetist. Five people are required to do the simplest of surgeries. What makes you think that one person is going to be able to do a cry comfortably on their own? You need at least one person to deploy the plant, and the rest of the team need to keep things going. They need to support that patient until the plan's in place. Do not keep any of these things to yourself. Identify the fact that you're worried. Identify the fact that you're thinking that you need a crike or you need another expert in the room. And identify the fact that you need to delegate something to somebody. Say it out loud. And my favorite way of doing things is to say, difficult intubation, going to bag mask. Bag mask might be difficult. Please call anesthesia. While anesthesia is coming, can we please set up a crike set and call another surgeon into the room? Thank you. Does anybody know what the plan is? They say yes. And I subsequently ask, who will be calling the anesthetist? Who will be calling the surgeon? Once the people identify themselves, my expectation is closed-loop communication. That speech has served me quite well in most of these situations. When you finally deploy, make sure that you've called for help, make sure that you've called for the crack set, and make sure that you have the tube next to you. Your tube should be something along the lines of either a size 6 or a size 5 uncuffed. The cuff is only going to get into the way. The technique that you use depends on how comfortable you are, whether or not you've had head and neck training in terms of surgical training or otherwise, and whether or not you've actually seen enough videos of them. And I never thought I would say this, but had I not seen enough videos of Crikes, and I'm going to put up one of, the, one of my favorite ones, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do my first one. And we'll talk about that more on a separate episode. And don't forget the sedation. The sedation is not just for the patient to forget about things. It, it helps you out as well. My favorite go-to in these situations is 25 increments of ketamine. But you do whatever you're comfortable with and your institution is comfortable with, uh, certainly. And remember the surgical thought process. It's a two-person thing. You need somebody to retract. You need somebody to position. And you need to be able to see. And we'll talk about that more in a separate uh, talk, hopefully. But um, thank you for listening, and um, I hope that th this didn't take too long, and I didn't ramble on too long. Uh, please let me know your thoughts and comments, and um, I guess uh, that's it, folks, for this week. Uh, stay tuned for other episodes, including how to prepare for uh, intubation when you have a first-timer or a non-expert uh, intubator doing it for the first time in the emergency room, and how to perform your first crike. Uh, this is Saud Al Zaid, and thank you for listening.